Auburn University, my own alma mater, my beloved Tigers, they're doing quite a few things to help out with this crisis. So this is an article from AL.com. Headline, it's given me hope. Auburn engineers use CPAP to make emergency ventilator to fill COVID-19 command. This is really cool. A team of engineers at Auburn University have developed an attachment to easily convert CPAP machines into ventilators in response to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. Michael Zabala, an engineer professor at Auburn, and his colleagues spent the last two weeks in his home garage developing the reInvent attachment after learning about the United States ventilator shortage. The device can be used with a CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure machine used to treat sleep apnea and assemble ventilators to treat patients with COVID-19. Now, this is really cool, obviously, because it's a person in the state of Alabama, a person that works for one of our state universities and his colleagues coming up with something that could save no telling how many lives, maybe hundreds of thousands of lives if this thing is implemented all across the state. And it, the cost is significantly less than it would be to build new ventilators if they can just repurpose your sleep apnea devices because there's got to be no telling how many thousands of these things all over the United States. And, and this would be one way also that citizens could really do something cool. So I used to have a roommate, for example, that had sleep apnea and he had a CPAP machine. I know that there's other people that, that have them and especially in a state like Alabama that might be hit really hard because we have an older population than the state surrounding us, well, that also means that they are more likely to have devices like a CPAP machine, which means that this might be something that really offsets the human cost, not only in Alabama, but in other states that have similar demographics that have an older population. For example, Florida. This could really help them because they have such an old average age and they're a very old state compared to some of their neighbors. Well, a lot of those people probably have sleep apnea machines like CPAP that you could attach this thing to. And it's also very similar to another news story that I was reading recently. There was a, uh, I believe a nurse. I don't even think it was a doctor. I'm pretty sure it was a nurse that was saying that they needed this one particular mechanism that they were out of. It was some kind of uh, attachment for a ventilator. And she got in touch with a nearby university that had a 3D printer. And she said, hey, can you print this part? And they said, well, let us take a look at it. And they did. And she gave them one of the parts that they had left over. And they were able to print it at a fraction of the cost. And they were able to print them much faster than the manufacturer was going to be able to put them out. And, and that probably saved some lives. Or at the very least made things easier for that hospital. And so it's really cool to see people from all around the country, you know, pulling together to try to help each other with this. And this is just a great example of it from our own state. I wanted to read this next little section because it says something interesting here too. This is a quote, quote by uh, Zabla. I spent a lot of time developing a two hour lecture on the biomechanics of singing which educated me tremendously in the area of anatomy associated with breathing and the physics that go behind it and other areas of the field that I really think paid off in this particular process, Zabla said. The reInvent device can be assembled in four hours with $700 in component parts in addition to the standard CPAP machine. The emergency ventilator system is made up from the CPAP machine, the reInvent valve assembly and tubing used in ventilators. The group of Auburn engineers worked with Dr. Glenn Woods, an anesthesiologist in Auburn, so another Auburn man helping out with this, to develop the device and is in the process of working with a local company in Auburn to help start the manufacturing devices. So you see, two really cool um, aspects about this is that you have those two forces coming together, an anesthesiologist that works at Auburn and an engineering professor that works at Auburn coming together to collaborate their work on this. And then they also work with a private company there in Auburn, another local business to help develop the thing and mass produce it. I mean, if this isn't America in a nutshell, I don't know what is. The story of people getting together, working together to help out their fellow man and doing it, you know, to benefit them. This is just a 
massive nod. It's not the only example, it's just a nod, and it shows the kind of ingenuity that people have all over the country, and this is happening everywhere. There are tons of small businesses, private businesses, completely retooling their uh, factories and their jobs and, and even reteaching their employees all to help out with this crisis. I know one thing that was really cool that was talked about recently in the news, Mike Lindell, the guy who owns my pillow, repurposing his factories to make like surgical masks and different things like that. We've talked about different car manufacturers figuring out ways to make ventilators for the demand that's coming. This is one of the reasons that even though I know that what's coming is bad and I'm not trying to downplay that at all, I know that it's going to be very hard for a lot of people. But what I am saying here is there is a lot of reason to be hopeful. We're Americans. This is who we are. We're the people that go to the moon and defeat the Nazis. We'll be okay. Our people are strong, they're intelligent. And when you open this thing up to the free market, there's no problem that we can't solve. Sometimes it takes a little time. Sometimes we, we've got to get our bearings and get our sea legs under us before we can do that. But, I mean, come on. We'll be able to handle this. And you have to keep in mind that all of these models that we're looking at, all of the things that we're seeing, they all ignore this stuff. And I'm not saying that they shouldn't, because they should. That's, that's how they... You don't deal with data you don't already have. You have to deal with what you've got. I'm not saying the models are bad. I'm just saying that you have to keep in mind that they don't take into account guys like this that see a problem and within just a few weeks of the problem being made, him being made aware of it, they come together with other Americans to figure out a way to make it work. I mean, that's the story of America in a nutshell. And if you want to go even further than this, here's another one, another story about another Auburn person. So Auburn University grad student helped to develop a COVID-19 test widely used in Alabama. This is the headline from AL.com. An Auburn University graduate student played a key role in helping a Birmingham company that brought a COVID-19 test from development to a, uh, to a clinic in less than two weeks and has produced more than 12,000 coronavirus test kits for use in Alabama and elsewhere. Richard Cullum, an Auburn University doctorate candidate in chemical engineering who earned his bachelor's degree at the University of South Alabama, works for Assurance Scientific Laboratories in Birmingham as a member of research and development, a research and development team that created the test. And then you skip down a little bit here. Assurance Scientific was one of the first commercial labs in the United States approved by the FDA for COVID-19 testing. Our COVID-19 test uses real-time reverse transcription polymerase chain reduction. I don't understand what that means, but <laughs> work with me here. This is a little bit over my head. I'm not a chemical engineer. Uh, to detect SARS-CoV-2, that's the virus that, that creates the uh, COVID-19, the virus, oh, it says that in the article, the virus that causes COVID-19 in upper and lower re respiratory specimens, Coleman said, Quote, we're relieved to see other commercial labs in the state and throughout the country now able to offer the testing and hope that more will continue to come on board each day to help with the demand, Thomas said. Quote, we have new machinery arriving daily and are continuing add, continually adding staff members, said Dr. Chad Austin, co-founder of Assurance Scientific. This will allow us to double our current capacity within the month to meet the overwhelming demand. You know, I think that kind of going back to the discussion we were having after we read the previous article, this is really kind of the same thing. And one of the things that is illustrated so well in this article is that the FDA would not approve the test for a long time. In fact, if you are looking at some of the research, because a lot of people are holding up South Korea as the golden standard to deal with this thing now, you know, looking aside from the things that would be a massive constitutional violation if they tried them here, like having individuals with the coronavirus being actually tracked on GPS on their phone and other people being able to look at that and see where all the people with corona are. I mean, massive 
uh, constitutional problems and a HIPAA violation on top of all that going into that. But even if you ignore that aspect of it, part of the reason they were able to do this, according to their own government, is that immediately when they heard about this problem, they got their private sector involved in creating new tests. In America, the FDA did not approve private companies and private labs for doing stuff like this until just a couple weeks ago, and when they did, we started seeing new tests like every day. There was new news almost every single day that a new test had come out. And we went from a test that takes about two, three days and didn't have a very accurate, I mean, it, it was mostly accurate, but you could occasionally get a false negative or a false pro positive. And we took it from that to in a matter of a couple of weeks, which is like light speed in medical terms, in, in the time that it normally takes for medical innovation to take place. We went from that to something that takes less than 15 minutes to get a result on. It only takes about a minute to get a sample to be able to test a person. I mean, that's insane. But that's America. That's who we are. You get the private sector involved in this, you get American ingenuity and American industry involved in this, there's nothing they can't accomplish. I mean, they, they put their mind to it, and th this is the way that we've eradicated the vast majority of diseases. You have to keep in mind, pandemics on this global scale were not that uncommon until the Industrial Revolution started innovating, and the medical field was a part of that. And so it just astounds me that there are people right now that are calling for more government intervention and a, a top-down system with central planning where there is no private sector health care, that it's actually even more socialist than Canada would be where they do still have a private health care system alongside their public option. That They just want to do away with all of that and move to a completely government-controlled health care system I don't see how anybody has been paying attention the past three weeks and would still hold that belief. I mean, this has been the greatest testament to what the American free market can do when it comes to innovation and being able to handle the science just so much better than the government does. I'm not saying that the government isn't trying to do a good job or anything like that. I'm just saying you open it up to the private sector. These are the kinds of results that you get. You don't have enough ventilators? Oh, well, we've got people making ventilators out of car factories and people inventing attachments to CPAP machines, which are wildly abundant in the, in the United States, to be converted for just, you know, these plastic parts and, you know, a few hundred dollars. Significantly cheaper than your normal, normal ventilators. And a lot of these people doing so not because they're looking for profit or not, but I mean, that would be okay too if they were doing that, but just because they want to help. That's what this country is all about. And that's the reason that I have a great deal of hope in our country and, and how we're going to be able to handle this. And what drives me nuts is that the media isn't talking about this. this is, these are not the stories that the media is talking about. All they're doing is talking about how bad everything is going to be. And I understand you got to be realistic with people. I try to be too. In a lot of ways, this is going to be something that is really bad for us. But ultimately, my hope outweighs that. And I think the vast majority of us, you know, th there's going to be a lot of heartache, but there's also going to be a lot of innovations that comes out of this thing. <laughs>